Welcome to the 2011 Northampton mayoral debate sponsored by Harold's Ice Cream. I see Steve Harrell out in the crowd there. Claims to have no ice cream with him right now, though. The League of Women's Voters, Northampton Community Television, The David Pakman Show, and Valley Free Radio. I'm David Pakman, and I'm going to introduce our panel for tonight. Scott Cohn is a journalist at uh, ABC 40. You probably know him from My Wide World, and it's great to have Scott here. Thanks, Scott. Mary Cerez in the middle is the founder and editor of Northampton Media. Thanks for being here, Mary. And on my left is Holly Rutledge, and we have actually two Northampton High School student panelists. They were both so qualified that we actually couldn't pick just one. So Holly is joining us now, and then after, Jacob uh, is going to uh, sit in for Holly, and we'll have a total of four panelists. So let me introduce both candidates, David Narkowitz, and Michael Bardsley. So this debate will have three parts. First, we're going to have uh, questions from the panel. Then the candidates will ask each other questions, and then we'll take your questions. Um, we are going to skip opening statements just to have more time for your questions and to figure out who is going to answer the, question, the first question first. We're going to have a friendly game of rock, paper, scissors. And I know you guys may not remember how it works. So paper covers rock, rock beats scissors, and scissors cut paper. All right, so one, two, three, shoot. Does that work? And make sure to you know, hold your hands up. I want everybody to see. One, two, three, shoot. All right, paper covers rock. So David will answer first. And for the first question, I will go to Scott Cohn. Go ahead, Scott. Hey, thank you, David. Um, I want to thank you for having me. Um, thank you for coming. It's, um, it's nice to be from the city of Springfield and be asked to participate in something like this, although I do, um, I'm heard on WHMP and WRSI every morning here in town. And um, I'd like to actually uh, congratulate the two of you if, you if the loser in this election wouldn't mind moving to Springfield so we could get one more good candidate. I know that I speak for the people in town, they would appreciate that. So. You both seem like you're equally qualified. Uh, you both seem like uh, nice fellows. Um, I, a friend of mine on Facebook said to me that uh, this mayoral election is not exactly uh, Nixon, um, you know, uh, Richard Nixon uh, running against someone completely different than him. We've got two guys who are, uh, there's, I don't really don't see that much difference between the two of you. So my question, the first question is, and this goes back a while, um, People I know in biz business in town say that uh, the city is not business friendly. They say the city does not do enough and work well enough with the businesses in town. And this isn't something that just has been going on recently. People have been saying this to me for 10 years every time I come up here. So uh, the fact that uh, you two have been involved in politics for the last 10 years in one form or another, um, I'd like to get your reaction to that. and. If you think it's true, what you think you could do to make that situation better? So before David answers first, the candidates will each have two minutes to respond. When you have 15 seconds left, these lights are going to flash. They're going to do it, trust me. And then when you're out of time, the lights will just stay on. So let's hope that the lights don't stay on too long today. David, go ahead. Great. Well, thank you, Scott. <clears throat> thank you for that, very much for that question. Um, the issue of business, of the city being business friendly and working with businesses, I think that's a, it, it, you know, it, it, as I go around, as I've served on the city council, um, I've heard that from time to time. I, I also know a lot of business people that are very actively engaged in the community and, and feel like the city has done a lot to support them as well. But it's one of those things that you always have to keep working on, uh, and particularly at a time when we're really facing uh, significant budget issues and, uh, and economic development and economic growth is a key part of what it's going to take uh, to be able to provide the city services, to be able to provide um, the revenue that we need, um, and to really tackle some of the problems that we have in that area. So uh, I'm really committed to the issue of economic development and really working with local businesses. I represented our downtown for, for four years as the Ward 4 city councilor and worked on a number of issues with business people, particularly around issues like parking, um, which is a major issue in terms of bringing people to downtown and doing it in an efficient way, in a safe way. I've also been very active in public safety issues, uh, worked to try to build a new police station and keep it downtown, which is something that the business community is really strongly behind. In terms of a strategy, I think, uh, I think my background in economic development 
development. I was an economic development director for John Olver. I've worked with businesses around the region. Uh, it's been one of the things that I did professionally, and it would be a focus of my administration, is work getting out in the community and trying to figure out what are the needs of our local businesses, our local businesses, as well as businesses that may want to locate here in Northampton. New entrepreneurs, new businesses that are that want to come here and take advantage of the uh, of the great opportunities we have. So that's going to be a major focus of my administration, and it's going to be something that I'm going to go to work every day trying to figure out how do we create economic opportunity uh, and how do we create a strong job base here in the community. Uh, again, so that we can then have a very strong ability to provide the services that people need uh, to keep our schools strong um, and to keep our city livable. Michael. Uh, thank you for the uh, question, Scott, and welcome to Northampton. Thanks for being here. Uh, when I was on the council, first elected to the council uh, 16 uh, years ago, 18 years ago actually, 16 years on the council, um, that was something I heard right away. And um, over a couple of years, I formed two groups to deal with some of the downtown issues. And one of them was a, uh, an ad hoc downtown committee where I had representatives from the uh, business community downtown meeting with uh, department heads and other folks in city government who uh, provided services that uh, interacted with uh, downtown. And we brain identified problems, brainstormed uh, solutions that a lot of trouble uh, shooting, and that committee uh, lasted as long as I was that ward counselor. Um, I also formed a downtown uh, residence uh, uh, association because downtown is also a neighborhood and those folks are the eyes and the ears of downtown in a key um, uh, uh, part of what makes downtown work and that group again that was very active group and after I left I think that group fell apart under uh, my predecessor the um, and uh, this recently I spent two days walking around downtown talking to uh, business owners downtown as well as in Florence, and that feeling is still there. Downtown business owners feel very disconnected from city government, and uh, I heard over and over again that they have not seen the mayor downtown, they have not seen the economic development coordinator downtown, and these are from uh, businesses who have been there for 16 years, some of whom have run one uh, recognition uh, nationwide or regionwide, and nothing from the city. So I will be the eyes and ears and a, uh, a very much a uh, spokesperson for downtown and advocating for downtown businesses. Next question will be from Mary Cerez. Hi, I'm Mary Cerez. I'm the founder of NorthamptonMedia.com. It's a local news site that covers city politics here in the wonderful city of Northampton. I too want to thank David Packman for being here for Northampton Community Television and Valley Free Radio for hosting this event. It's great to see such a good media turnout here. I see reporters from the Gazette, from Mass Live, from Northampton Media. Um, it's an honor to be here. Uh, my first question has to do with the way the city is going to manage its trash after the landfill closes next year. A committee is currently looking at the city's options for managing um, solid waste and recycling once the regional landfill closes. Former Mayor Higgins has charged, she did charge this committee with finding a solution that's economically self-sustaining. What's the best solution and why? So this will go to Michael first. <clears throat> well, two years ago that was an issue and um, wh what I was saying two years ago is we needed to let the, uh, the landfill close. Either way, um, regardless of the result of the, uh, the referendum, um, because um, the, uh, the timing was such that even if the referendum uh, was in support of the expansion, there wasn't enough time to actually expand it. So it was going to close. And I said, let's use that as an opportunity to institute rigorous recycling and reuse programs. And that is just beginning to happen. And I think what we need to do is define what our solid core of our waste is. We don't know that. As a community, we became very, very dependent on, on the landfill. And there's a lot of uh, habits that we have to uh, break. And I know there are many people in the community who are avid recyclers and do a great job. But we need to uh, spread out that practice so we reduce that. And there's a number, there's been a lot of effort recently to get new programs in, whether it's ar around fabrics and uh, um, organics, et cetera. So that's great, and we need to continue in that direction. 
Um, one of the things up with the, the landfill also is that in terms of the expansion, the city council took a vote that said they did not want the landfill over a water supply source. But what's still hanging out there is the waiver from the state. And since the, uh, the vote has come in from the, uh, uh, the, the citizens, and since the city council has taken that vote about not having a landfill over the uh, uh, a water supply. Um, I think, uh, as mayor, I will return that waiver to the state. We don't need it. Um, the, the people have spoken. The city council has spoken. And to me, that gives a very clear direction of that we're not going to be dependent on the landfill. Uh, when, the, uh, when the decision was made by the Board of Public Works and the mayor not to proceed with the landfill uh, expansion after the vote, um, I have a city council president. I tried to take leadership of that issue, and I brought forth a resolution saying exactly uh, that we needed to now focus on the future. We had to focus on what the post land, what we were going to do in the post landfill environment. Uh, I called for a task force. Uh, be careful what you call for, because then I got appointed to serve on the task force. Uh, I served on that task force for I think it was about six to eight months, and we came up with a, a series of recommendations to the city about how we're going to do things in the short term, what we're going to be looking at in the long term in terms of you know how we're going to promote more recycling, how we're going to increase the city's compost program, how we're going to look at reuse programs, um, and what is it that we're going to do once that landfill closes and we join the the hundreds of other communities around the state who don't have a landfill and then have to figure out a way to deal with their trash. Um, part of that's education. Um, there's, also a, there's also a lot of work to be done at the state level, uh, which I've tried to take a leadership role on, because many of the policies around solid waste in our state impact directly how the kinds of waste that we have to deal with. I formed a statewide uh, committee, of, I'm the chair of it, uh, called the Product Stewardship Council for Massachusetts, and we've been working on these issues at the state level, trying to get an e-waste bill adopted, trying to get uh, uh, employer, um, um, trying to get manufacturing standards that put more of the onus on uh, manufacturers creating more recyclable products and creating better packaging. Because uh, again, we're dealing with the waste stream here at the local level. Trying to get a bottle bill passed, an updated bottle bill passed. So there's stuff to be done here at the local level, at the state level. As mayor, this is going to be one of the key issues that I'll have to deal with. Uh, and it's an issue that I have a lot of knowledge of, having served on the task force. And I'm committed to figuring out a solution that's affordable, that's environmentally responsible, and that allows all of us to take responsibility for the waste that we generate and figure out ways that we can reduce our own personal contribution to it. Holly Rutledge will ask our next question. Hi, I'm Holly. I'm a senior at Northampton High School, and thank you for inviting me here tonight. Um, in the past years, there have been many budget cuts for public schools, which have resulted in the loss of teaching positions and resources. Often the first programs to go are the arts, which are a crucial part of the Northampton school system and community. How would you work to ensure that public schools receive appropriate funding to continue providing quality, diverse education? Thank you. That's a great question. And um, I have two kids in the schools who've been in the elementary schools and are now at JFK, so I, I understand uh, what those years have been like, where every year there's a, an issue of, are we going to have phys ed? Are we going to have art? Is our music programs going to be combined? I think it's a, it's a problem that's been going on. And it's part of our larger issue of our overall city budget and how do we pr provide the resources that we need uh, for our schools, for our city services. Um, I think. Some of the issues that we want to talk about in that regard are getting back a little bit to the economic development issues. You know, how do we create more revenue in the city? I think there's also reform efforts at the state level that we have to be an active voice in dealing with. Um, I was part of a group that went to Boston earlier this year to talk about how do we reform our, our state in terms of funding formulas, in terms of having a progressive income tax, in terms of giving the kinds of aid and support that we need at the state level. And I've also stood up for our schools when it comes time to talk about issues like the budget and how we can make uh, choices, the kinds of choices that we need to make to make sure that we're providing the resources that they need. And that includes standing up for the override. Uh, when that issue came before the community uh, and we were uh, talking to people about how do we prevent layoffs, how do we prevent deep cuts to our schools, and I stood forward as a leader and took a position on that issue, a strong position on, the, on that issue, and advocated for our schools in that way. Um, so I think it's a great question, it's a perennial issue, and it's going to take a lot of work between our school committee, the mayor, the city council, uh, trying to figure out ways that we can uh, 
provide those services, provide the funding that we need for our schools uh, so that we can continue to provide the, the high quality education that, that our, our parents and our children deserve. Michael? Uh, thank you for that question, Holly. As um, you may know, I have spent uh, uh, 33 years at, in the uh, public schools as a career as a, a professional uh, educator, classroom teacher, guidance counselor, principal, uh, assistant principal. And I've been involved in a number of educational uh, uh, efforts and a number of leadership roles. In this community, um, I have played leadership roles on several overrides. I was um, the co-leader of the, the override effort for the expansion of this school. And the building that we're in right now um, was uh, the, what we're enjoying here in the improvements was part of that um, effort and it was an override that eventually the community uh, voted in an overwhelming number. But that wasn't guaranteed at the beginning of that process. I was also uh, one of the leaders of the override for the JFK Middle School renovation and, and the pool, which again was in a very controversial issue at the time. Um, in uh, 1999, I believe it was, the, no the then Northampton Education Association awarded me one of its awards of the Friend of Education for my work in the schools in this community. Um, the, the two things that we need to look at, one is the budget and the priorities within the budget, and I think the city can do a much better job in, in pri identifying priorities and make sure uh, money is spent wisely and that the appropriate amount of money goes to the schools. And another one is revenues, and I think we need to increase the uh, revenue streams as much as possible. Um, I, too, was in that uh, contingent from Northampton that went to the State House. But that's not an immediate, any kind of reform on income tax. It's an immediate uh, solution. Uh, we need to do things that are immediate, and that's revenue, and that's budget priorities. Next question will be from Scott Kahn. Okay, thanks, David. I'm, I'm of course, uh, I have a list of questions here, but I'd like to go off my own script for a moment and maybe combine the last two questions that were asked of uh, the two of you guys. Um, one of the big controversies in the city of Springfield was uh, Mayor Sarno and the trash fee. Um, it was in, it was out, and he's caught a lot of heat for that over the uh, past few years and continues to. Um, with your uh, landfill situation changing and, uh, and appetite for uh, a proposition uh, override, not necessarily as tasty now as it might have been in years past because of our changing political climate. Um, and speaking of trash, we all, trash affects everyone. Are either of you prepared, creativity notwithstanding, are you prepared to look the voters in the eye and say, we need a trash fee and you're going to be cutting a check and paying to pick up your trash or paying for a recycling program. Is that something that is in the future? And if it came to that, would you be uh, willing to do that to the, to the uh, constituents? First to Michael. Uh, I think it's, uh, it's not too early to ask that question, but I think it's too early to give a definitive answer to that question. I think we need a lot more information. And as I said earlier, we don't know what our hardcore trash stream is right now. So I think we need to do a lot of work a around uh, the recycling programs and to get uh, people to participate in those and really reduce the, uh, the amount of trash they're uh, generating that would eventually go to uh, uh, some landfill. We also do not know what the, uh, the effects are from some of the private vendors. We've had a, a facility offer, um, open up and they have, um, are offering their services for a fee. Um, the people who are using that service are very happy with it they reportedly are paying less than they were for the city. So we need to look at that. It, it's gonna take, a, I think, a period of time for things to settle down and just see what our hardcore trash problem is. I'm, I'm in favor for the city to get out of the trash uh, business. Um, that's, that would be my inclination. I would look for staying in the recycling uh, business and to encourage that and do a, a, the various efforts needed around comprehensive recycling. Um, but I think the trash business has not been particularly a, a, a good venture for us. And I think we have private uh, enterprises here who have a pretty good track record. But we need to look at what the results are. 
Well, Scott, <clears throat> we do have a we do have trash fees in Northampton. We we run a, we run a transfer station system. People pay a, a vehicle fee yep. to join that, and then they pay a per unit cost to, to dispose of their trash. And I think one of the things that came through loud and clear uh, when we made a decision as a community that we weren't going to have a landfill anymore was that the cost of trash was going to increase. I mean, that's just a, that's a given part of it. Uh, that our costs were going to increase, and that was one of the things we had to factor in when we made that decision and moving forward. Um, I do think there is one of the things that came out of this task force that I served on was the idea that there's sort of a short term, we need to look in the short term, you know, in the remaining year or so before the landfill closes, you know, what the landscape looks like in the, in the, in the industry. There are a number of haulers who've already started taking their trash elsewhere. We have this other private competitor. We also have private trash haulers. Um, so there's a lot of different moving pieces to it. Um, but I do think we've had to, we have had to raise our fee already since we reached that decision on the landfill. And I do think that if we're going to continue to operate a transfer station, once that landfill closes, then we're going to have to then build into the cost of what it costs to go to that transfer station and take your trash there to that fee. You know, if you're in Northampton now, you pay a relatively low fee because we're still bringing our trash to the landfill. If you're across the river in Amherst, um, they're paying a much higher fee because it has to it reflect the cost of the transportation to take that trash somewhere else with a third party. So um, I there have no illusions. If we are going to continue to provide the service, it's going to cost uh, it's going to cost the residents who use that service more. But I'm committed to figuring out. How can we reduce our overall waste stream? How can we help, help people do that? And is there a way we can provide a really cost-effective service? Maybe it's not the transfer station model. Maybe there's other models. Curbside is something that's been very effective in communities that have done a lot of work in terms of reducing their waste. Um, so those are the things that we have to think about. Next question is from Mary Cerez. OK. Um, given the power of the mayor to make appointments and nominations, <coughs> excuse me. Um, some that need city council approval and some that can be made unilaterally. Are there any city departments, committees, or key staff positions that you would shake up with new energy and new blood, Mr. Narkowitz? Yeah, the, the, uh, the appointment, we have a number of city bodies and committees, regulatory bodies, uh, bodies that make policy, and that is one of the key roles of the, of the mayor is to put forward nominations and then the city council has to review them and approve them. Um, I think one of the things that I would try to do, and it's something I've actually tried to do as a counselor, is really try to open up that appointment process and really try to get uh, many more people to apply to serve on city boards. I think that's been one of the things we heard, is one of the feedback we heard during the, the best practices process that we both went through together, um, is how do we reach out and get more people to, uh, to apply so that there's a broader range of voices, a broader range of experiences. Um, I think I'd want to work with the city council, for example. Uh, they represent, you know, unique constituencies and try to get them involved in bringing forward people. We have a great network of neighborhood associations in the city, which seems like a, a great feeder for the kinds of people who want to get involved on city <coughs> boards and on city committees. So uh, as, as, as uh, openings happen up, as openings are created, I want to take a look at those and figure out are there people out there that, uh, that haven't served on city boards that bring a unique perspective that we can put on there. Um, and I think one of the areas that I disagreed with, uh, with my, uh, my predecessor on in this regard was this idea of, you know, bringing in more sort of divergent voices, bringing in people that um, have been critical of city government. My approach is they care about, they're critical because they care about the city and they want to be involved. So let's get them involved. Let's get them involved in the process. So I would be, that would be the, the sort of thinking that I would have in that regard in terms of trying to get as many people as we can involved in city government. Michael? Uh, uh, this is going back a little Michael, make so sure to speak into the microphone, because some people in the back are having a little trouble hearing you. Oh, okay, thank you. Um, when Mary Ford was uh, first uh, elected uh, mayor, um, I had been uh, uh, one of her co-campaign managers. And what, one of the first initiatives she did was to set up a uh, committee to encourage more people to um, apply for appointments. And uh, I chaired that, co-chaired that with uh, Maureen uh, Tobin, who had been a, somebody who had worked for uh, 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 the opponent for that particular year. And we did a very uh, aggressive outreach and we redid the application. We went around to the community and we talked to people. We explained the process, we explained the committees. 
And that generated a whole pool of applications and a whole um, uh, sort of a culture within the city for a period of time where people were coming forward to volunteer. Um, that sort of dried up over, over the recent years. And I think that needs to happen again. And I will uh, take the lead to make sure there's an aggressive outreach into the community and not just with the neighborhood associations, because sometimes they are as exclusive as the city uh, government, or at least that's the perception. I would go out into areas where people uh, haven't been involved, and that may be um, uh, the um, institutions of faith, that may be different uh, clubs, different organizations. I will go out there and do that outreach. Um, another thing is when we did the committee reorganization several uh, uh, years ago, I was a person who uh, did the bulk of the writing for the appointments and evaluations committee. And that was intended to add a whole other dynamic to the uh, appointment process. And I think it has been fairly successful. And I will work with the city council to enhance that role of this. Next question is from Holly. Earlier we were talking about the importance of business and encouraging economic growth in Northampton. How would you balance um, encouraging business with supporting environmental issues such as protecting open spaces and encouraging alternative energy sources? First to Michael. Um, well, the, the, uh, the slogan I have uh, used in the past is what's good for Northampton is good for business. And uh, what I, uh, an example that I, I mean by that is um, I sponsored the, uh, the Downtown Architectural Review Committee, which was very controversial with um, some business owners at the time. And it, it passed, uh, worked very hard with them to get them to agree. We made compromises. And it turned out to be very successful. And the Northampton business community won awards for, for that um, uh, ordinance existing. And so my point behind that is a lot of things that people initially uh, resist can in, in fact be positive ones. And Northampton is attractive because it's a community that cares. It cares about people, it cares about the environment. And I don't see in, environmental measures at all as being restrictive to, to business. And as a matter of fact, I think Northampton is a perfect place to do a lot of aggressive outreach for, to bring in green businesses. And that's one of the things I would do under the economic development piece. So I think it's a perfect match. I really, I know there's some potential uh, tension there, but I don't see that as a, a roadblock at all. And I can work with businesses and, and looking at ways where they can improve their, uh, their practices as it impacts the environment and also to offer other services in terms of green businesses and offering jobs. David? Yeah, well, <clears throat> definitely this was a conversation that we had during the, during the work that was done on the sustainability plan a couple of years ago, was trying to figure out how do we strike that balance of you know, wanting to keep the open space, wanting to keep uh, our concern for the environment, but also wanting to make sure that we are strong economically and sustainably economically. And, and I do think that we have a really great uh, uh, ethic in terms of wanting to promote businesses that, that fit with sort of the character of Northampton. We have a really strong local business base. You know, we're one of the few communities that still have local booksellers, that you know, we have local, uh, local hardware stores. We have a lot of things that a lot of communities have lost because I think they've taken their eye off you know, those kinds of key uh, values in a community. Uh, one of the things I did as a city councilor was uh, uh, put together a program, suggested a program to reward businesses that are making these kinds of uh, green energy improvements to their business. Uh, we did a recognition program where we brought businesses forward to the city council to sort of call out the businesses that are doing work like putting you know, A to Z uh, Science and Learning Center, putting a solar array on their, on their store, or the local dry cleaners that had switched to a more sustainable green uh, dry cleaning process. Um, so I think uh, there are ways that we can try to encourage those kinds of things. I also think energy, uh, the alternative energy piece, I mean, that's great for business. Uh, we're working on a program right now called Northampton Leading the Way, which I've been part of putting together, where we're actually going out to businesses to help them figure out, are there ways you can reduce your energy footprint? Are there ways that you can uh, uh, work your business more efficiently by reducing your energy costs? And I was also proud to be part of the effort to, to have Northampton designated as a green community. 
uh, which happened a couple, uh, which happened last year, where we were then eligible for funding for alternative energy uh, kinds of projects like the new photovoltaic array that we've installed at Smith Vocational School. So I think there's a lot of great opportunities in this area. I think there's a lot of people that are interested in it, and it really fits well with sort of the ethics and the values of Northampton. So it's definitely something I would try to promote. Before Scott starts our last round of panelist questions, we'll say good night to Holly Rutledge, and Jacob Levitt will join us for the last round. Go ahead, Scott. Okay. Um, I'd like to uh, address the, the tenor of the campaign. Um, in my preparation to come up and be a panelist tonight, I you know, tried to read as much as I could, and I don't hear all the ads that might be on, on radio. But uh, there was one ad in the Gazette that I found uh, that, was, uh, that interested me. Um, it was um, uh, Mr. Bartley's uh, recent ad about his opponent, Mr. Narkowitz, and uh, it showed a picture of him um, riding a bicycle. And the picture was uh, very youthful, maybe perhaps a little bit uh, silly, and it said, quote, I like the idea of the bike, it's the training wheels that bother me. And um, a little bit later in the copy in the ad, there was questions raised about um, Mr. Narkowitz being handpicked by the former mayor uh, to be in office right now when uh, Mayor Higgins left. Um, so that was actually two shots in one. It was actually a very, a very creative ad, so congratulations on that. My question is to Mr. Bardley, do you think the ad was negative? And I'd like to ask Mr. Narkowitz, uh, did he think the ad was fair? So first to David. Did I think the ad was Did negative? you think the ad was fair? Uh, I thought it was negative. Um, in terms of fairness, I mean, I, I, I made it no secret that I ride a bicycle. Uh, and, uh, and it's been something that I've worked hard to promote, uh, this uh, cycling, uh, trying to promote cycling, trying to promote uh, alternative transportation. So as part of my campaign, I, I tried to incorporate that into it. Um, in terms of Talking about my qualifications, I don't really know what that has to do with my qualifications to be mayor. It seemed to be that was the thing about calling into question whether I had enough experience, you know, whether I had enough time on the city council, whether my background in the Air Force, whether my background working on Capitol Hill, whether my background working for John Olver as his economic development director, whether these were actual qualifications for the job of mayor. Um, You're very sharp that way. I think that's exactly what he was alluding to. And so in terms of that, uh, you know, I. I Again, I've tried to run a very positive campaign. I've tried to talk about issues. I've been out all around the city talking with people about real issues uh, and, and really talking about the challenges that lie ahead and the kind of leadership that we need. I think people uh, you know, who've been watching the national debate are, are really sort of tired of the politics of negative and, and the politics of trying to divide people. And, and so I've made a very conscious effort in this campaign to stay positive to talk about a positive message and a positive vision for Northampton. And I've talked about my, not only my qualifications, but the things that I've actually done while I've been in city government uh, to back it up. So Michael Bardsley, the question was, did you find the ad negative? The, I, I don't think the uh, ad was negative. It, it, made, uh, it made comments uh, um, about my uh, experiences, and I, it was to raise the issue around uh, qualifications and experience. It was unusual. It was um, sort of uh, out of the box in a certain way, and it, had, it was ironic. It had some uh, an attempt at humor. It was uh, um, written by the, uh, the same person who did the ads uh, two years ago, for uh, Mayor Higgins, and she had some ads that were very biting, probably even more negative if, if, that, if, if you thought it was negative in some of her ads. And it, but it didn't attack a person's character, and it didn't attack, a, it wasn't name calling, as there has been some name calling. So it was, um, to me, it was um, something that was different. It made people think, it jolted people. You know, some people liked it, some people didn't, but it raised the issue. And the, um, the issue, in addition to the issue of uh, qualifications and experience, the other issue, and you um, alluded to it in your question, the other issue is that the whole thing about uh, decisions being made uh, behind the scenes, you know, in terms of people being other handpicked. And a lot of times in this city, there's a feeling that um, decisions are not um, um, passed or made on the merits. 
and that there have been discussions going on behind the scenes and that uh, the, uh, the solutions or a decision has already been made. And that has added a great deal of um, frustration to people and that's why there's, you know, uh, from time to time anger coming out around various issues. So that is what it tapped into, and, and you picked it up, and I thank you for that, because that is very much an issue in, the, in this campaign, and it's something that people have to think about. Next question is from Mary Sarez. Okay, um, we all know that a controversial proposal for a Hilton Garden Inn hotel was advanced for the roundhouse lot behind Pulaski Park a couple of years ago, and that the proposal failed for lack of financing, and that the city subsequently got sued by the developer. Um, what's the status of the roundhouse lot? What should it be used for going forward, and how should that decision be made? First to Michael. Well, the, uh, the potential is still there for uh, the development of that, I, I believe, and I, don't, I do not believe there has been any um, efforts in terms of uh, writing a, a, a request for proposals. Um, but the process that should be used is we need to have a community discussion at the beginning of that uh, process where the ideas are uh, uh, vetted um, and we consider a whole wide range. And then when the request for a proposal is uh, put out there, it should reflect some of those ideas or what, if there's any sense of a consensus or what's going to work, it should reflect those. That didn't happen last time around. The, uh, the idea was presented um, to, I think, a couple of different bodies. I happened to be on the finance committee at the time. We had a very uh, interesting uh, conversation. Um, ideas came out about what it could look like back there. One of the ideas that was pushed forward by myself and uh, Councilor Murphy at the time was using whatever in, uh, business came in there to work as a partner with the Academy of Music that was struggling at the time and have them as be like a corporate sponsor. Um, the Center for the Arts was looking for a place to move at the time. We were looking at the basement of the uh, Memorial Hall and that could have been a little art enclave and had an art park in there and, and a real identity to it. Uh, when the RFP came out, nada. There was nothing in there to, re to reflect any of that, and, and I think that was a, a mistake. Um, so that's what we need to prevent. Um, when we go out there with a proposal, it needs to reflect um, the values and, and the discussion that we've had in the community. And I think that would um, hopefully uh, avoid um, a very controversial proposal like we had last time, which I oppose, by the way. David? Yeah, I think in terms of the process, there's definitely a lot of lessons to be learned from it. Uh, and, I, and I have to point out that uh, my opponent was city council president at the time that the city council essentially uh, turned the land over to the mayor and essentially gave her full authority to do whatever she wanted with it in terms of developing an RFP, in terms of whatever. I think the city council had a lot of control in that process. Uh, we control city property. Um, and so, uh, so I think there's some responsibility that has to be shared by not only uh, the, the process, but also what the city council's role was in that. In terms of going forward, there is still ongoing litigation that still has not been settled, so that's going to work its way through. Hopefully we'll find a resolution to it, but I do think we have an opportunity to sort of redo that process, to, to really try to get ideas. I talked about at, the, uh, at a recent debate where we talked about this, this issue, um, the, the sort of the idea of putting a big sign there that says, ideas wanted. You know, we want to try to get as many ideas, not from, from within the community, but there may be people out there, development folks, who have some unique ideas about how it could be used, and then try to gather all that information, and then again, sit down and try to figure out, okay, what do we think really is, as a community, what the best use of this land is, and let's put together a proposal, and let's try to go out and see, are there people out there that are interested in making it happen? And, and, and really taking up a, uh, a corner of the city where there's great potential for um, adding a real uh, addition to our downtown, possibly adding some potential um, new green space, uh, uh, helping to, to restore that park in some measure. So I think there's a lot of opportunities, but I think we have, to, we have an opportunity to redo the process and we have to do it correctly. Um, and it's very important that we do that. And it's something that I'll work on if I have that opportunity as mayor. Our last panel question will be from Jacob Levitt. Thank you. The economic viability of our country and the greater international community is currently a major po political concern among voters. Just in the last month, beginning with the Occupy Wall Street movement 
and expanding rapidly, the voice of the people of America is beginning to be heard. Even in our very own Northampton, a similar movement has formed, accordingly titled Occupy Northampton. What is your opinion of these movements, and what do you think you could do as the mayor of Northampton to stimulate the economy and promote economic sustainability? First to David. That's a great question, Jacob, and, and certainly, uh, like many Americans have been watching that whole process unfold and watching the, the, the Occupy effort not only in New York, but now it's been spreading out to Boston and to here in the Valley. And I think it reflects kind of a reaction to what's happened over the last several years, where we've had this you know, economic crisis, uh, we've had uh, you know, banks that have collapsed, we've had financial malfeasance that hasn't been well regulated, we've had the subprime mortgage scandal, you know, we've had all of these things that have sort of happened um, uh, in our economy, um, and the response to sort of how do we fix them has been, well, uh, you know, those banks are too big to fail, we have to bail them out, uh, we have to, there's no real going after the people who wrote those bad mortgages, um, and darn it, we can't make any tax cuts for the wealthy, we really have to look at how can we cut social programs, and how can we make, you know, deep cuts in healthcare and those kinds of things. So I think people feel like there's a disconnect. Um, in terms of what the response has been at the national level and that we're not focusing on things like unemployment, we're not focusing on things like jobs, uh, not focusing on things like, you know, why are our roads and bridges crumbling um, and, and not focusing on things like, you know, why are cities and towns all across America, you know, faced with having to lay off employees and having to, uh, you know, to, to, to figure out how they're going to make their next year's budget. So there, I think what it's reacting to is sort of this disconnect between what's happening at the federal level and sort of the facts on the ground. And so I think as a city, I mean, actually, we've been having some of this conversation, you know, in terms of the struggles that we've been having locally with, you know, whether it's unemployment or whether it's with, uh, you know, people that are, that are having a hard time, you know, living month to month to try to make it um, in, the, in the local economy, but also our local city budget. And, and having to figure out how are we going to pay for schools, how are we going to pay to fix our roads, you know, how are we going to do all those things. So I think it's important that you know, we keep that conversation going locally and really talk about it and talk about as a community, you know, what are the ways that we're going to bring ourselves out of this together as a community? What are the things we can do at the local level, but also talk to the, to the leaders at the national level as well about Michael? the changes that need to happen there? Um, thank you for the question, uh, Jacob. Uh, I'm going to take uh, uh, just a few seconds to go back to the previous question and correct uh, David is that the, uh, the city council charged the mayor in conjunction with the finance, uh, the economic development committee uh, to work on that RFP. So the council did stay involved, but it was with, through one of its uh, the members of the council on that particular committee. So I think you uh, missed that fact there. Um, the uh, the Occupy uh, Wall Street movement and the, uh, the various other uh, efforts that have uh, uh, emerged from that, Boston and locally, um, is a sign that of the, uh, the, the work, what I call the working middle class folks, have really been um, uh, pushed a lot, really being taxed heavily and having, um, not just with taxes, but with uh, what is referred to as corporate greed, really encroach on the lifestyle and the earning capacity of the working middle class. And they're really at a, uh, um, a, a crisis point in this country. And it is in conjunction, it really uh, mirrors the uh, the effort that has happened over the last several decades where it's the erosion of the influence of unions, quite frankly. And that has, the decline of, of unions has really cr created this imbalance with c corporate America. And it doesn't just uh, affect unionized people, it affects all working people. And so that is what we're seeing. And whether or not this, uh, the Occupy movement will evolve into anything that's significant and has an impact remains to, to be seen. Um, uh, there tends, you know, I'm, I'm a person from an organizing background and I tend to look, okay, what's the organization? How is this going to be sustained? So that's the challenge for that movement. But they are really rep uh, representing the crisis of working middle class people. And that is something I spoke about two years ago and I have spoke about in this campaign of working people in this community and that's a top priority of mine. That does it for panel questions. Next we'll have candidate questions. Since David answered first in the first round, uh, Michael will answer first, meaning the question comes from David. Okay, uh, <clears throat> continuing a little bit on a theme we've talked about, um, 
Uh, you've built your campaign around a slogan, uh, elected not selected, and as part of that, you've implied that the former mayor's resignation was somehow tied to avoid triggering a special election, despite the fact that the city clerk, the city solicitor, and other legal authorities um, have made it clear that there's no provision for a special election for mayor in our charter. Last Friday on WHMP radio, you raised this same special election issue again, and when corrected, you stated that it was somehow open to interpretation. Uh, can you please tell me tonight specifically you know, what language or inter in the charter, what interpretation you're referring to, and absent that, can we correct the record once and for all on this issue? Well, to, co to correct you in your question, first of all, that is not the theme of my campaign. The theme of my campaign is everybody's mayor. And so let's that be clear. That is what my intent is in terms of working, of representing everybody in, the, in this community. And the second point I want to correct you on is I did not raise the issue. The issue was raised by uh, the interviewer there, uh, Mr. Newman, who is on the radio as, a, as a, allegedly as a journalist, but he's also a campaign supporter of yours. He contributed money to your campaign uh, recently and as of last year. Uh, he has your bumper sticker on his car. So that was a very pointed question on his, his behalf. So let's just make it clear on that one, David. The, the thing behind, and I've already answered this with uh, Mr. Cohen's question, it, people are tired of things happening behind closed doors. They want decisions made out front, and there is the appearance, regardless of the specifics, that there was a, an orchestration or some type of cooperation in this in terms of the departure of the mayor. And I'll go back to an article that was written in 2008, I believe, in January, by Dan Crowley, that mentioned about how there was uh, clear evidence or perception that the mayor was grooming you to be the next mayor. And many people were in on that discussion. So let's be honest about that. You've been thinking about being mayor for some time. You and I have had that discussion at your house, as a matter of fact. So this isn't anything that I'm, I'm inventing at the last minute. And it's really about transparency and honesty and integrity. Next question will be from Michael to David. The uh, Best Practices Committee was formed to address uh, numerous concerns regarding how the uh, city government operates. And one of the most frequent statements we heard was a call for term limits for the mayor. Uh, what is your current position on term limits for the mayor? Uh, I know that was an issue we talked about. We talked about term limits for city council. We talked about it for some of the other city bodies. Um, and one of the pieces about that was the issue of the charter and looking at the charter and, and can we reform the charter. And so out of the best practices committee, I actually uh, sponsored the legislation to create a charter review committee. I appointed the charter review committee. Uh, and that charter review committee did specify looking at term limits for mayor, for city council, for other elected officials. Um, I personally, having uh, been involved in city, in, in government, um, and, and thought about this issue about term limits in general, am not a supporter of term limits generally. I think that uh, we have term limits, they're called elections. Uh, people go to the polls and they have an opportunity to elect, uh, elect candidates. I know we do have term limits at the federal level for our president, but beyond that, I think the term limit issue is something that, uh, that I think the voters have control over. That said, we have a charter of revision committee, we have a charter drafting committee that's going to have a public conversation about that. And, uh, and I think that's going to be one of the issues that will come out uh, during that process. And I think it's something that the community will have an opportunity to weigh in on, particularly if we bring a new charter to the electorate, to the voters, and give them an opportunity to vote on this issue of do they want to have term limits for the mayor or for the city council or for any other elected uh, body for that matter. Thank you. Next, we'll go to audience questions. Uh, Ingrid, how, what do we want to do first? Well, I've been, uh, I've been given some questions from audience members and also ones that were submitted via email before the debate. So I'll start off with just a couple of those. And then um, if people have questions prepared, if they want to start making a line behind me, and, and, then, um, and then I'll step in and ask more questions as we have gaps <laughs> to fill. Okay. So everybody knows these will be 90 seconds per response and uh, we'll, we'll, the first response will be from David Narkowitz. Okay. 
If elected for mayor, what would you do to encourage and preserve privately owned, inexpensive housing? In other words, housing that does not get any form of governmental subsidy. First to David. Okay. Yeah, well definitely we have a lot of, uh, we have a lot of uh, great old neighborhoods and a lot of housing stock in the city that's really important. And I think one of the ways that we can do, one of the things we can do to help preserve that is look at some of our zoning regulations. Earlier this year, I, um, I was uh, supported zoning regulations that helped people stay in their homes longer by giving them more of an ability to put additions on, for example, particularly out in parts of the city where we have a lot of older stock. Uh, and people don't want to be able to, they don't want to do major additions, they just want to be able to put small additions on their home to be able to live in it. I think one of the other key areas is energy efficiency. Um, I actually co-sponsored an event last week, with, uh, two weeks ago, with Ward 6 City Councilor Marianne Labarge out in her ward where there are a number of old style homes that still have electric heat, that don't have a lot of electricity, uh, don't have a lot of insulation, and trying to work with the city to, to reach out to those people to help them plug into programs uh, that will allow them to make their home more energy efficient, allow them to live in their home more comfortably, allow them to save money. Um, so I think there's a lot of things that city government can do to try to promote that, to try to make it easier for people to live in the city, to keep it more affordable, and we have to try to play a positive role in doing that. I think, and so, so things like zoning, things like the energy piece, as well as things like you know, trying to create um, uh, tax incentives for people that, that want to make improvements to their home uh, and, and that perhaps they can get rebates for doing it through energy and through other measures as well. Um, uh, that's an area where I think the, uh, the city has uh, dropped the ball. Um, we have had a number of um, uh, owners, uh, landlords, who have uh, in the past had affordable housing, um, apartments where, and what I mean by that, where working people could afford to live. There was a whole neighborhood off the Green Street, West Street, uh, Belmont Avenue, and uh, gradually that was being torn down for the expansion of Smith. And when that started to happen, I was very active, although late in the game in some ways, but very active in listening to what was going on there and trying to slow that down and come up with some alternatives. Um, we have lost a lot of those, and it's going to take a lot of work and some creative thinking to do it. I do think there are programs, and if the, uh, uh, the Community Preservation uh, Act is, survives in the city, and if the leaders of that committee are open to uh, new ideas, I think there's ways to leverage money for home repairs, for energy efficiency, where people who are, have owned those homes right now and especially if they are um, either elderly people or people on um, reduced uh, income, that they could, uh, an arrangement could be worked out to keep that home affordable in the future. So, but there are some ideas out there, there are some programs, we just have to be receptive to making those work. The city has not been receptive to those ideas in the past. A group of Northampton residents is concerned about the possible effects of the pending sale of the Clark School campus to a private developer. The Clark School Round Hill neighborhood is a part of Northampton distinguished for its historic architecture and long and rich history. Do you think the City Council should approve the proposed extension of the Elm Street Historic District to Round Hill in order to help preserve the historic character of the area? First to Michael. The, um uh, I do not know a lot of the details of that. I just heard about that yesterday and I understand there was a neighborhood meeting tonight, as a matter of fact, that obviously I couldn't go to. The, um, uh, I am in favor of doing the measures necessary to protect the character of neighborhoods. And I think um, I'm opposed to any development that's going to come in there and drastically change the character of the neighborhood. I have a record of doing that, as I said, in the, uh, the Green Street, uh, West Street, um, area. I have a record of doing that in the North Street development in Ward 3 where I live. Um, I was also the, uh, the counselor who opposed and raised a lot of, lot of questions to the educational overlay district and the, uh, um, some of the potential effects that would have on the neighborhoods around there and some of the same neighborhoods I believe that we're talking about. So I would um, play a very aggressive role in making sure the character of that neighborhood is not destroyed. Yes, I, I have uh, met with the folks who live in that neighborhood who've met with me to talk about some of the concerns they have about the potential 
uh, impacts on the neighborhood and traffic and the historic character of the neighborhood uh, by a future redevelopment of Clark School. I've also met, reached out and tried to talk to Clark School to try to figure out you know, what their plans are and, and what they're thinking. And I know that there have been meetings between the two as well. Um, the idea of, an Elm Street his, of, of extending the Elm Street Historic District has, uh, is now in the Elm Street Historic District Commission, uh, which is studying that matter. They're putting together a work plan, and they're going to have, I think, some public hearings on it um, to think about, to, to get feedback from people about whether that's the right approach. I think that is a, that is a potential approach uh, to, try to, to try to address that situation. There may also be an approach where, uh, around a development agreement, for example, where a development agreement could be worked out with neighbor with the neighborhood with the city to try to figure out what that's going to look like I think it's it's early in the process and I know that discussion has begun and I'll definitely take a look at it um, I won't actually won't be able to vote on it probably either way uh, as a city councilor because I won't be a city councilor and, and I won't be able to vote on it as mayor but it's something that'll come before the council we have a pretty detailed process that's governed by state law for how this historic district function works and I think, again, the, the key is trying to make sure that it fits with the character of the neighborhood, the historic character of the neighborhood, and that that process is open and people have input to it. So do we want to go to the first uh, person behind you? And please uh, tell us your name. My name is Barry Roth. I'm a Northampton resident. And my question goes to open government. Uh, that seems to be a big issue for both, both uh, candidates. And so my question is, a city councilor raised a question about the legality involving the, an expired contract which involved the distribution of a half million dollars to approximately 45 city employees over and above their salary. My question is, what do you think of the legality of distributing city revenues in that manner? And secondly, uh, David, since you were acting in the role of the mayor, and you were also on the Finance Committee, how come you had ample notice about this issue coming up, and yet when it was asked to allow for discussion, and this goes to the heart of open, open government, you in the Finance Committee never allowed a discussion to arise, and in fact, in your leading of the city government, okay, we actually two, we want, three, we want three the questions that night to, 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 to see you want to get discussion. it all in. There you go. Thank you. Congratulations. Uh, we want to make sure all the questions can be answered by both candidates. Okay. It's your turn first, David. Yeah, I, I feel the same question from Mr. Roth at the last debate, and, and it was an issue of we have a system where we have um, the compensation uh, system for our firefighters is based on the previous year's pay. It gets calculated at the end of the year, and then it comes to the city council uh, in July, and we essentially, we've had a long-standing practice of having to take the two votes to be able to fund those, those agreed upon uh, 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 stipends. And so uh, it's a practice, as I outlined, has happened before. In fact, my opponent has actually voted to take two readings at meetings before the same similar process. So I think, that, I think we're sort of confusing two different issues, the issue of the process that we use and then the contract itself. I think, the, I think raising questions, as I said at that meeting, about the way that the compensation system is set up is, is, is a valid question, and it's something that we could talk about. My point at the time, and I was very clear about it, was it really needed to happen in the collective bargaining process, because that was a contract uh, for the previous year that was uh, in good standing, and we needed to honor that, pay the work that our city employees had done for the previous year. Um, uh, and again, if we want to have that larger policy discussion, that's fine. But we were doing essentially something we'd done in, in every previous year during the time that we've been funding uh, that program. So uh, that's the distinction, I think, in terms of what we were doing. Well, actually, there's a further distinction. And in that contract, there, there is a, a mechanism for distributing uh, the uh, monies, if their monies exist, for the stipends. And then there's a clause after that and it is, refers to excess revenue, and which is a very um, unusual concept, I think, for a, a city that's kind of a strap for revenue. And there is a, um, a mechanism there for what they call profit sharing of this excess revenue. And that is what was being questioned. And the, the, gov uh, the, the contract um, is negotiated by the mayor. The city council does not have input into that. that. That whole concept around excess revenue and process 
sharing is what was being uh, questioned by the, uh, the counselor. And that had been done actually several meetings prior. And so that was a concept that could have been discussed at a finance committee meeting, um, and, but uh, my understanding, it, it wasn't. So that was really the issue is, how do we have this concept when uh, these very tough economic times where we had to take money away from teachers, that we have a contract with um, something, the language is excess revenue and a profit sharing program. Well, as someone who was at that meeting, I'd like to make a little point of clarification. Please tell, on us, that. tell us your name. My name is Ernie Brill. I'm a teacher. I'll re um, first of all, the money that's raised by EMT people, that whole service, okay, hold is on. city we, money. We, we, we have a long a line, and we've only got 20 minutes left. So all I think right. the best thing would be to get to the I'll next have question. I'll my question then, okay? The end of Claire Higgins' mayorship was marked by a deplorable attack on two of the city's major unions, the Police Officers Association and the New England Teachers Association, asking both unions to forego earned step increases negotiated decades ago. In the spring, the city at first outright refused to bargain collectively with the teachers' union until the teachers' union came to a school committee meeting with 400 people at which Mayor Higgins chided them for acting in a way that wasn't a good role model for their kids, to which we replied, it was an excellent role modeling for our kids, which is fighting for what you believe in and need. As it stands right now in this wonderful liberal city, the police and the teachers' unions have filed unfair labor practice against the city of Northampton. The firefighters' union is an arbitration, even though the EMT firefighters, 43 of them, received stipends of $8,000 each from 452000 which was left over after salaries and overtime, and which is actually money raised that is considered... Ernie, I need city. to ask you to ask the question part of this. Hold on, this is part of the question. It's, it's a very long question. Yeah. It's general city money that can be given to anybody. So... The teachers' union is in the process of a grinding negotiation. So all three major unions The next sentence has to end with a question mark, or we're yeah. moving on. The question is, what will you do as mayor to ensure that this town doesn't get the reputation of being an anti-union, union-busting city, and to ensure fair play and economic justice for the workers of this city particularly the police and the teachers and the city workers who have no union at all. First to Michael. I was at the, uh, the school committee meeting in which the, uh, uh, the vote was taken by the school committee and the, uh, there was a large community turnout of several hundred people to, uh, to protest the, uh, the treatment of the teachers. And I thought what went on, how the teachers were handled was uh, deplorable and it were, was very reminiscent of the, uh, the behaviors that we had uh, witnessed earlier in the year in Wisconsin. And I had um, taken part in various demonstrations against that, be, uh, that behavior and I was sort of appalled to see something reminiscent of that happening in my own community. Um, I respect workers too much, I respect teachers, educators too much to ever treat them in a, a bullying and a disrespectful manner. I would never do that, and you have to take my word on that. As an educator, I have spent my lifetime uh, dedicating to serving others, and I have also uh, spent a lot of time working for uh, labor rights and, and workers' rights. So that would not happen. There, there will be time wearing the mayor's hat while I will be in conflict with unions, but I know that role to play. I can play that role without being condescending and demeaning and disrespectful. Uh, yeah, the, so I, I'm, I don't want to spend a lot more time on the firefighter thing other than to say again, uh, this was a collective bargaining issue. We can go into executive session as a city council to talk about what the bargaining strategy is, but in terms of respecting people's rights in the process, uh, that was the decision about why we weren't going to do it that way. 
In terms of what happened with the teachers and the, and the school committee, I think, you know, um, our teachers care deeply about schools and about education. I know our school committee does as well. And I think that was a really unfortunate situation that occurred, uh, probably about a lot of miscommunication, a lot of animosity. Um, about the best I could say is that it would not happen if I were mayor and if I am mayor. Because I think one of the things we have to work on is this issue of, you know, we're, uh, we're all on the same team in terms of what it is we're trying to provide. City employees, city management, citizens. You know, we want to have the best schools. We want to have, you know, the best services that we can offer our community. And so I think one of the roles of the mayor is to take a leadership role in that and to try to work through those conflicts and try to figure out what, and part of it's information. I think that's the other piece, is that there's sometimes a lot of misinformation on both sides of these debates, including the misinformation about what the teachers union may think about what the firefighters are getting and vice versa, all that kind of stuff. So I think one of the roles of the mayor is to be able to provide city employees with really good information about the budget and bring them to be part of the discussion about how are we going to figure this thing out? How are we going to work out a solution so that we can figure out how to make sure you're well paid we can also provide the services that we want, and we're not laying off uh, city employees during really tough, tough economic times. Sue Timberlake, um, this is a short question. Uh, in, bus <laughs> in, in business, um, people know that there are really, well, the city of Northampton is a huge business. It's what, 90? 90 million dollars, somewhere in that range. And the mayor's race is really for the CEO of this business. So here's the question. In business, um, there are staff positions which have nobody reporting to them. Those are aides, specialists, consultants. And then there are line positions where you actually have responsibility for hiring and firing and for people's raises. So what paid positions have you had, both of you, that would entitle you to be the CEO of a $93 million business? This goes first to David. Yeah. Uh, so I, I've had a, a lot of different experiences that I think would contribute to my being able to play that role as the, as the leader, as the CEO of our company. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I was in the Air Force for six years. One of the things that I worked, uh, my specialty in that was, was personnel administration, was working on this issue of managing a large organization, uh, managing people. I was a, I was a non-commissioned officer. And, uh, and had supervisory responsibility over, over uh, subordinates to work with them as a team to try to figure out how we carried out that mission. Uh, in working in the U.S. House of Representatives, as I mentioned earlier, I was uh, Economic Development Director for John Olver. I oversaw staff in our three district offices in Western and Central Massachusetts and led that team on trying to carry out the Congressman's mission of trying to provide economic development, economic opportunity, federal funding uh, to the cities and towns that he represent. And that entailed you know, bringing that group together. It entailed hiring people to serve on that staff. Um, and then in city government, I've had experience, obviously, uh, as city council president, we have to manage a, a, an office and a staff. And I've worked with city department heads in many different capacities in terms of my work, for example, on the Transportation and Parking Commission, where I served with you know, four of the major department heads and have had to interact with city staff in that regard. So I feel like I have a, a, a broad base of experience in that regard. I've also served on many hiring committees. Uh, here in the city, promotion committees. So I have a really good understanding of that process, and I think I could bring a lot to that job in terms of managing the city and being the, uh, being the leader of our city. Michael? In uh, referring back to the, uh, the previous question very briefly, uh, David mentioned about the leadership role of the, uh, the mayor in terms of uh, negotiating uh, contracts, but there's also a leadership role of the city council and the city council president in passing a budget that is b uh, based on, that's on the backs of the employees without any discussion or any comment being made. And that was really, I think, uh, a serious um, o omission. And it was one of the things that really went into uh, increasing some of the negative morale in the city. And that's, I have a lot of experience in managing employees. I have evaluated people, I have hired people, and there have been occasions where I had to recommend people to um, uh, be fired. And the key concept there is accountability. I will hold people accountable. I also will work with uh, the, the department heads and within departments for team building. 
Um, we need to do a better job of planning. When there isn't uh, coherent planning, it really puts a lot of stress on, on employees. And in a lot of our departments, we do not have plans. For example, in the fire department, there is no plans of how to pay for those positions in the fire department once the grants run out. And I will take the, uh, there's a, a fear factor going on with a lot of our employees. They're afraid to come forward. I will deal with that so this is a, in a, an environment where employees can come forward with ideas and uh, share their thoughts about how to do things better. Loretta Goodgen from Florence. Um, I'm going to change my question because that was actually my question. So I'm going to ask you the same question I asked the at-large counselors at the other forum. Um, sometimes I find it's my last resort to be heard by city government is to go to the public comment session at the city council meetings to be heard, hoping that someone will respond to what I'm saying um, because there is no response when you're standing there. Um, the other question I would like to add to that is what would you do to make sure that the city government uh, follows through within their departments, um, building department and the planning department on their decision making and how will you reach out to people who feel that uh, public comment is their last resort? Michael's going to answer first. Um, just looking at the clock, I think we're going to have time for these two answers and then one more question. Um, we only have the space until 8.30 and we need time for closing statements. So first to Michael. Um, the, uh, I, I think it's a, uh, represent a, a failure of city government when the public comment session is the last resort. And I, I think I may correct you just a little bit in that. For many people, it's not the last resort. The last resort is actually suing the city. And I think there's a number of uh, citizens who have been forced to take the, the city to court, and that has been very, very expensive for us, and it's very unfortunate. There's a lot of antagonism there. Um, I can remember a, uh, uh, an example when there was a, a gentleman who had had the uh, city sewer system back up into his uh, cellar uh, three times. He came before the council, and on three separate occasions he spoke to the council. The first time he did that, I called him up a few days afterwards, and I said, you probably have been answering the phone, you know, uh, for the last several days with various phone calls. I apologize to add to that burden. And he said to me, Councillor Bodsley, you're wrong. Uh, you're, the, uh, you're the first person who called. There was no response. And that gentleman got increasingly angry with, uh, with when that problem was not dealt with. Um, ironically enough, that anger was identified with me, and somehow I was held accountable for that. But we have to do a better job of listening to our citizens and doing problem solving early on. And there's no excuse for having people come to that microphone as a last resort. In terms of the issue of the, the public comment session being a last resort, I, I do think that means that we have to do a better job of letting people understand how the city processes work, to know that there are other places that they can go, to, to know how they can reach their elected officials, and, and to be able to really have um, customer-friendly departments where if you have a problem with the planning department or the Board of Public Works, that you feel like you can go in there and talk to them about it. And I think that's something that I will try to bring to city government. Um, I also think there's ways that we can, uh, we can help people using technology. I think, you know, we have city employees that in many cases we've cut their departments quite significantly. They're managing big workloads. They're trying to track a lot of permits. They're trying to, I think we can use technology, for example, as a way to help with permit tracking. And, and maybe allow citizens to be able to do some of that, to be able to get right, and we've done that in some sense where we've implemented a new online permitting system so that not only, it's real time, when you submit a permit, not only does the city receive it, but other people can look at it and be able to see what that permit is, how does it affect their neighborhood, et cetera. So, um, so I do think that's an important question about, you know, how do we make uh, city government more open, more accessible? Um, it's one of the things that I've tried to do as a city councilor is be 
be very much out in the community and talking to people and responding to people's questions, responding by email, responding to phone calls. Um, and I think we have to kind of imbue city government with that same concern so that people do feel like when they have an issue, when they have a problem, they can come to city government and we're there to help. We work for the people of this city and we're there to help them solve the problems that they have. My name is Sherry Taylor. First, I'd like to thank both of you, no matter who wins, that you have stood up and are willing to lead the city at this difficult economic time. So that's first of all. Second of all, my question is about Cooley Dickinson Hospital to change this subject. Cooley Dickinson Hospital is an integral part of our community. I think it's very important, and we all believe that it's important for it to be here. Financially, they're in trouble now, and they're looking at partnering with people as far away as Boston or even Tennessee. There's another source where people are supporting Western Massachusetts. What do you think the city's role is in working with Cooley Dickinson Hospital? Do you think we have a role, and do you think you, what do you think you would do to offer to help us? This goes first to David. Yeah, this is definitely an important uh, question because uh, Cooley Dickinson, you know, a hospital is a core institution in the community. Um, and I know this is an issue that's of great concern to people, not just people in the community, but also employees at Cooley Dickinson who are really concerned about the future and about what's going to happen. Um, the city definitely has an interest because they're also, you know, we, we have a large workforce that gets this health care through Cooley Dickinson Hospital. So it's a, it's a concern on many different levels, not just for the community and having good access to good community health care, but also the city has an interest in making sure that there's a strong and vibrant local hospital. I've reached out and, uh, and talked with the folks at Cooley Dickinson to get a better understanding of, of the things that they're trying to deal with. Obviously, they're operating in sort of a new landscape of healthcare in the country uh, where it's very difficult, makes it very hard for small hospitals like Cooley Dickinson to operate. So they believe that they really need to partner with someone else in the community. Um, they do have a community board, which I think is important, a board that's made up of community members whose job it is to try to make sure that the values of the hospital and the values of the community are reflected in that process. So I'm hopeful that they will hear the, 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 the voices that people that, that have been talking about this issue in the community and will really try to make sure that, you know, whatever choice they make uh, in terms of partnering with someone else, that they can maintain that community-based approach to health care and have good accessible health care, not only for citizens, but for the many city employees that we have to provide health care for as well. Michael? Um, I currently have a, a couple of different roles with the, with the hospital. The hospital obviously is a, a community um, a hospital, a very uh, much a integral part of Northampton. And in working with uh, the, um, the hospital, I have helped uh, institute or beginning to design a, a program that would assist families who are dealing with uh, dementia and there's a program that was called the Dementia Initiative. We um, were pooling some resources and working very much with the hospital to help families on this issue, and not a whole lot is uh, being uh, said about that and, and talked about that, that problem, so we um, raised that, that question. We had an outpouring of support and interest from the community. That's what a community hospital is supposed to do. My fear is that we would lose those community programs if we had an outside um, organization organization come in, especially a for-profit, because I don't know what the profit is in, in, um, in a program like that. Um, the other uh, way, I, uh, the role that I played is in uh, supporting the nurses and working with the nurses. Uh, they had a, a demonstration during the summer where the nurses went in to, um, and they show you the nurses are really uh, kind of ahead of the, on the curve in this one. They went to Wall Street and they had a demonstration in Wall Street during the summer, and it was called Wall Street versus Main Street. And I went down in solidarity with the nurses and looking at their concerns and working with them. And then they had an informational picketing um, in front of the hospital around their concerns about the contract, and I stood with them on that. And that's because they're an, uh, uh, they're a part of this community. Um, the, the other level is Time. working with the, uh, the management, and that would be a challenge I would uh, look forward to. We're going to move on to closing statements. These will be three minutes each, and first is Michael Bardsley. A question that has been uh, asked more than once since this debate season has begun is this. 
What differentiates you from your opponent? I am happy to address that question because to me it's a, it's a very easy one. First, experience. 33 years as a professional educator in the Amherst public school system and over 20 years as a public servant in our city government. Um, the experience of my opponent doesn't measure up to that. Second, leadership. Not only was I city council president uh, for eight years, but I have a solid track record as an advocate for a quality public education. As I said in 1999, I believe, the Northampton Teachers Association um, awarded me one of their Friends of Education Awards. I have been a champion of human and civil rights. Um, I have been a union leader and a tireless advocate around labor issues. And my opponent does not have a uh, similar track record in those experiences at all. Uh, but don't take my word for it. Uh, compare our literature. Each of these, and if you haven't seen them, I would encourage you to pick up one from each campaign, makes a very, very strong statement about who we are and what we stand for. Talk, talk to our supporters. Listen to the words of the people who support us. And I do not think you will find similar answers. Um, and we're a small community. I know people who are supporting David. I have spoken with them. And here's a composite of some of the things I've heard. David is a centrist, I was told. And uh, the criticism of me is that I have associated myself with those that are disaffiliated and disenfranchised. Guilty as charged. Um, David is a defender of the status quo. He's an insider who can get things done behind the scenes. And my favorite one was David is the candidate who most sounds like a lawyer. Um, I identify with a wide range of folks, those in the center as well as those on the fringes, those disaffiliated and disenfranchised. I am the agent of change, not the defender of the status quo. I have worked in open arenas for change, the classroom, the council chambers, and even the streets when necessary. That's what democracy looks like. I do, and I assure you, I do not aspire to sound like a lawyer. The differences are very clear. They're clear to the people who are supporting us in our, our campaign. I am the people person, and that is why I ask you to elect me as everybody's mayor on Tuesday, November 8th. Thank you very much for being here this evening. David, three minutes. Well, I want to begin by thanking David Packman, the League of Women Voters, NCTV, Valley Free Radio, and Harold's Ice Cream for putting together tonight's event, and to thank our news panel and the great questions and the, and the people who asked great questions from the audience. I want to say a special thank you to my wife, Yelena, who's here tonight, and our kids, Emma and Zoe, who are home, uh, hopefully finishing their homework, uh, for their love and support throughout the campaign. Northampton is an excellent place to live, to work, to learn, to run a business, and to raise a family. We have so much to be proud of as a community, but we also face many challenges. I'm running for mayor because I want to keep Northampton strong, and I want to make it better. I was born and raised in Western Mass in a large working class family of nine kids. My parents taught me the value of hard work and installed a, instilled a strong ethic of community service and in community involvement. I served my country in the Air Force after high school, was a student leader at UMass, worked as a congressional aide both in Washington and here in Massachusetts, and have been an active volunteer in our community, our schools, and our local government. During my three terms on the city council, I've been a positive and productive representative and a leader. I've never shied away from tough issues or hard work. You never find me on the sidelines when there's a tough issue or a tough vote, waiting to see what the political wins are and what makes best sense for my political future. I've brought people together to create innovative solutions and tangible results to improve our community. Since announcing my candidacy, I've knocked on hundreds of doors and sat in dozens of kitchens and living rooms across our city, listening and sharing ideas and discussing my vision for creating economic opportunity and jobs, keeping our city livable and affordable, maintaining strong public schools, delivering smart, cost-effective city services, protecting our environment and keeping Northampton green and sustainable, fostering active neighborhood and citizen participation, and leading a government that is open, fair, and transparent. 
This election is a critical one for our city and presents a stark choice. Are we going to be stuck in the past, pointing fingers and dwelling on old fights and differences? There will always be real disagreements. The question is, how do we come together to resolve them? Do we choose to look forward, to talk about the future of our city, and decide how to work together to reach our goals? I believe that Northampton needs a mayor with a positive vision and a steady, proven track record of leadership and results. A mayor who will unite our city and work hard every day for all of its people to find the innovative solutions to the challenges we face. I am the candidate with the experience, the ideas, the energy, and the commitment to offer a new generation of leadership to move our great city forward. Thank you all for being here, and I hope I can earn your vote on November 8th. Thanks to Harold's Ice Cream, League of Women's Voters, our panel, and our candidates. Good night.